I find myself today here in the headquarters of Chai Lifeline Camp Simcha in the offices of Rabbi Simcha Scholar. This is a man who's uh, very hard to lock down. He's always on the move, always got stuff going on, meetings and hustling for the betterment and for the um, for the growth of the organization Chai Lifeline, which I've had the, uh, the honor and the privilege of being a part of uh, firsthand experiencing Camp Simcha's work for four summers. And uh, listen, Rabbi, it's, 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 an, it's a really great to be back here in the office and sitting across from you. And I'm, I'm excited to delve deeper into what Chai Lifeline does, but also to get to know you a bit a bit more. You know, it's good to see you again because uh, once you're part of the Camp Simcha family, you're family. Oh. And um, that's what Chai Lifeline is all about, actually. If you wanted to define the overwhelming response to our success, if you get down to the, to the central point, is we deal with everyone and everybody as family. Mm. And in a family, there are, when someone hurts in a family, the entire family shakes. So even though we deal with 5,800 families a day through 14 regional offices throughout the world, and we deal with all different types of situations, uh, whether it's camp and the kids are happy, sure. or at the hospitals where the kids need to become happy, or families in crisis, or Project High, our crisis intervention uh, division that are dealing with some horrific situations like in Muncie or Jersey City or Poway. Right. And all different elements and types and all different parts of, the, of our community but to us, it's all family. Mm -hmm. So and for family, you do everything possible. And for us, every family is the only family. Oh, so to be part of this family is, is truly an honor. Um, and I, I have to say, you, you, you've really nailed the, the good. You've, you've done this once or twice. I mean, whoever's coaching you in PR, I mean, have you always been so affluent and fluent in, in your way of being? I mean, within a casual conversation, you mentioned all the branches, how many families you're doing, all the services. I mean, this, this conversation is done. You know? First of all, fluent, yes. Affluent, I don't think will ever be. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Affluence, perhaps, in, in, in knowledge. But yes. I, I, I think it's important uh, you know, for us to understand the, the germination and the development of High Lifeline. You know, High Lifeline was not something that I applied for as a job. My, my background is I uh, was a teacher in high schools, in Jewish sure. high schools, uh, Hebrew Academy, the Five Towns in Rockaway, Westchester Hebrew High School. I was a synagogue rabbi for 12 years. Mm. Uh, and that was my career path. Sure. And, I mean, that's uh, the thing. Before there was High Life, before there was Camp Simcha, there was, even before there was Rabbi Simcha Scala, there was just Simcha Scala, right? There was, there was, uh, there, a, there still is Simcha Scala. That's all I am. Uh -huh. I'm just regular Simcha Scala who happened to have become a rabbi, who happened to have been able to have the privilege of developing this organization. I was brought up in Westbury, Long Island. Mm -hmm. uh, was there somebody it, in, your, in your childhood that you looked up to, that a role model around chesed, around kindness, that you're like, wow, this is something I want to em emulate when I, when I was well, growing you know, up? My parents, uh, my father was an active rabbi, uh, was a teacher. My mother uh, was his partner. And, and that's how we were brought up our family, that we have to help others. Um, and uh, I went to Mir Yeshiva and... Um, uh, before I went to Mir Yeshiva, I went to Chavetz Chaim, and Rabbi Gavriel Ginsberg was a person that really helped me create my vision mm -hmm. of life, and Mir Yeshiva, of course, developed me as the, as the total person. And, um, and when you were there, and my wife you... was, uh, of oh. course, the most important uh, element to the completion of these visions. That's it. We're not even five minutes in this podcast. And a shout out to the good old wife Michelle, of which I also I know through the through the through the family organization, and she is Mamish uh, a, a rock and a really a really special person. Um, no better, no 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 doubt about that. But um, be, bring me back to that time when you're, you know, in yeshiva or growing up and you're a young adult. Did you have a specific idea of what you saw yourself like growing, going into professionally? Was there, I mean, a perhaps business? Was there something you want to become? Did you want to become a teacher growing up? Was there something specific that you had, you had to focus on? Well, I always wanted to give back to, to the Jewish community. I wanted to uh, get involved in education. I wanted to get involved in outreach. Mm. I wanted to perhaps be a, a synagogue rabbi. Uh, you know, I was a yeshiva student. I, I went to um, 
uh, I have two college degrees of a master's in business and a master's in, in education, but that really wasn't my focus. Wow. My focus was, was to do outreach. I had the privilege of being the national advisor for NCSY for a number of years. That's right. So I saw, I, you know, I had a world vision, a world experience of their, you know, of what to, the, the possibilities were to be able to do something, to be able to make a difference. And, um, and that was really our career path. You know, we wanted to make a difference. So the Rosh Yeshiva, the heads of Mir Yeshiva, I guess saw my desires or perhaps they were able to tap into my potential and they encouraged me to develop uh, in that in that path. Mm -hmm. And that was the career path. You know, I became a teacher, I became a rabbi. So, and, right. um, so was there a time in your life, was there someone close in your, in your family or a family friend that that got sick or that was not well, that you realized that a change has to be done? Like what triggered you and, and, and pushed you to develop this, um, this organization, to start this to, from, from the seed and from the ground up? Well, there was nothing personal, thank uh -huh. God. Baruch Hashem. Um, Baruch Hashem, everybody was is healthy and well, and it wasn't for a personal reason that High Lifeline began, but while I was a rabbi of a synagogue in, in, in Brooklyn, um, this opportunity came about uh, through a member of the synagogue. The opportunity uh, that th there was something in the development or something? something was... The opportunity to help a sick child. Okay. Uh, then we saw this as a tremendous opportunity to, it was a, uh, to help people. We saw this as an opportunity to help all types of people in the community. Who were what, sick? Who were sick, yeah. To, to chesed, kindness and generosity is the, is the great uh, is 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 the great band aid that puts all the pieces together, uh, because it's it's obviously so it's loving a Jew in its most pristine way. So we're you know we're able to bring everyone together by helping them by by recognizing their needs. So mm -hmm. this was a great opportunity. So I saw this as kind of a, a vision that you know we can really do something great for the community as a whole. So we began with one child, and then we then there were seven kids in Camp Simcha, and then the whole thing just began to blossom. So it took me. So it, it started off you coming across a a child who was sick, and then it was like, okay, let's build a camp for him. Or well, like, actually, what? the initial the initial idea of Camp Simcha was not mine. Okay. Um, Thirty two years ago, the concept of camps for sick children was just about germinating in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. There was no kosher camp. The original idea of a kosher camp for children that were sick was Rabbi Pinchas Harowitz, the Chusterov, who was our, we were partners together for the first few years of Chai Lifeline. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really his concept. The development of that concept and the development of the whole Chai Lifeline that I had the privilege of being able to do this, uh, the development of Kem Simcha, which is a very which, which which took a lot of years to develop the concept, the philosophy, the 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 execution, you know, was was also uh, something that I had the privilege of developing. Wow. But the original the original seed was not um, placed by me. Uh, perhaps I did all the work and the agriculture to be able to that seed should be able to blossom to become one of the biggest community based organizations in the world, but. It was not me. So, so the, we kind of learned as things grew. And this whole idea happened while I was still a teacher, while I was still a rabbi. Wow. And you slowly- You married, you were a young married man at the we time. Were, yeah, we were, yeah, we were married already for 10 years. Oh, okay. uh, you know, we were married for 10 years. Wow. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, you had, so this, so this opportunity comes about, you know, this idea of, of camps. And do, just paint me a picture, because it seems like through High Life Lens Holy Work, now it's a lot less stigmatized um, which I don't know if it was the, was part of the reason why initially this was all taking place or maybe in the back end of it, but that now it's like, you know, for quite a while, even when I was growing up and I'm not that old, um, was it, people sort of hid away or like didn't really talk about the, the, the person in their family, the child or the brother, or the sister who's, who's not well, who's sick. We would never, we would be scared. We would never even say the word cancer. You know, it just, it would send shivers down our spine. We were so afraid of it. Um, and by being afraid of it, we always think about it, you know? So it was like, it was sort of get us from both ends. But I think through that work, it sort of, it, it sort of brought us down, but uh, it sort of destigmatized that whole idea. Back then though, I'm sure even more so, it was, it was frightening. I even read in an article that you would have to literally go to people's doors and I think knowing that they had someone sick, but they were turning you away. That's correct. Yes, there's no question about it that Kai Lifeline was solely responsible for changing the way how the community looks 
at illness, at disability, and even as mental health needs, because our whole project High Concept changed that. So we did it through very contemporary marketing techniques. We did it through being very precise and aggressive, um, doing it in the right way, really feeling the needs uh, of the contemporary community, speaking to them, using the whole concept. The concept of Bikor Cholim, of visiting the sick, is not a high lifeline concept. This is a concept that was introduced by God to Avram, to Abraham. Sure, so yeah. uh, so it's not our concept. It's in our blood. But, 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 but the, to modernize it and to professionalize it and to, um, to, to create a, a, an organization out of it, yes, that was the high lifeline concept. Now, an organization is very, very important because when a person does good things, generosity, chesed, after that person, and in the, you know, and that person accomplishes a lot, and there were many individuals that have accomplished tremendous amounts and still accomplish tremendous amounts. But when that person is tired or retires or God forbid leaves this world, there's a tremendous vacuum. The concept of an organization is that no matter who's in charge, the organization goes on. And that is the primary difference between us and everybody else. A, we modernized the techniques, we used marketing, we used everything that the community had available, social media available, whatever was available at, at, at those days, and we, and, we, and we brought a normalization to an abnormal situation. We took the word yena machla and we put the word cancer to it. We took a sick child and we publicly displayed it in order that it should sensitize the people to it. And we addressed it and we, and we, and we allowed them to become normal citizens in an abnormal situation. How did you approach these families back then who, you know, when, when things were a bit harder and people didn't want to bring it out to the light that they had someone who was sick in the family, how did you encourage them that this would be beneficial for not only for themselves or for the child, but for, for the Jewish community at home? We went literally door to door of families, of, of people that we knew that had a child that was sick. We knocked on the door. Sometimes they didn't let us in. Sometimes we had to put our right foot in, so they would. In my my right foot is permanently damaged from being slammed with mine <laughs> so many, for many years, you know. And and we, we and we spoke to them, and it was not an easy thing. And mm -hmm. and the camp, and the organization grew piece by piece, until um, eventually it became an in thing. You know, there, there there was a time thirty years ago we we couldn't get a staff member to come to the camp. Really, we quit. We had to beg people to become staff members. Now we beg people not to apply as staff sure, members. Sure, yeah. Now it's but, 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 uh, you know, waiting, waiting list. But but the the uh, there was a, it was a whole day, it was it was a dramatic social change uh, that we um, were privileged to be part of, or maybe you know happened. Was there a defining uh, moment that you realized that wow, this is actually working? That this is taking taking. You moment? know, we never looked back. One of the great rabbis of the generation, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach instructed me, actually this was his last instruction to me, he said, you have to build a worldwide organization for one child. And I never understood what that meant. Mm. But, I, but now I understand what it means. It means that even though you're, you're building a worldwide organization and you're dealing with over 5,800 families, but every child needs to feel like they're the only ones. Mm. So yes, there were times we took, a, you know, we, we took a step back and we said, wow, look at all this, it's unbelievable. But then there are times that we keep on, we just focus in on that single child and say, you know something, we gotta go forward. So there are many challenges to, you know, to what we're doing. Uh, there's, there's the, the growth factor, the, the, the amount of sick people are growing, there's the financial factor, sure. but we, we keep on focusing in on that sick child and we have, the most incredible selfless staff that literally works 24 seven. We have the most unbelievable altruistic volunteers that are the, the lifeline of this organization. So between all that together, you know, creating a cadre of people over the years, it has become a powerful movement that changed the face of our community. I travel the world and I'm, I'm like always, proud and astounded to find out, you know, I was once a Kem Simcha counselor, 25 years ago, I was yeah, once a Kem Simcha, yeah. and, it, and, I, and I asked them, and what did it do for you? It changed my life. Mm. Is there, I mean, there, I can attest to that. I mean, even growing up at, you know, being in middle school, elementary school, we would, 
in, in Connecticut, in Orange, Connecticut, there was, um, we would get these little pamphlets from High Life Line right. and we'd go around and we'd do like the different like swimathons or whatnot and fr- fundraise money. And like, what do we know? Like, you were just a little town in like in, in Connecticut, New Haven. Like, you guys really did a great job reaching all four and the corners of the, of the, of the earth um, and, and really getting your name out there and, and, and impacting and helping so many people. Um, and yes, the highlights that I, that I remember from camp. Um, are like, you know, are coming in and thinking like, oh yeah, you know, we're gonna go and give so much and like help these kids out and give them the best time. And, you know, just listening to some of the conversations that take place at night or just being in that atmosphere. I mean, I walked away with so much insight and so much deeper depth of understanding, appreciation of gratitude, of 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 just, of so of, of living and being alive. And I learned so much from these kids than I, than I, than I gave, you know, as, as the orientation, right? As our demonstrator counselor says, you know, the more you give, the more you'll get. As simple as that. Um, but earlier on, you know, there's, there's, you know, you went to business school and I, and I believe in, I never went to business school, but I, understanding the idea of like having a business plan and figuring out what you're going to do. When you enter this, I, you know, this mission and this, of, high, of Camp Simcha initially, did you even have an idea? Were there certain goals? Do you have an idea of the, of how vast this will get? Or you were just like rubbing two pennies together and okay, maybe we'll have one kid or five kids. What, what did that, what was that process like? <laughs> you know, in the traditional business plan sense, we didn't have it. Uh, I have a master's in business. I, I needed to make my mother happy. She wanted to make sure that I make a living. <laughs> she did not want me to go into rabbinics or any type of you know Jewish education. Sure. She wanted me to you know have a you know a, a livelihood. Uh, you know. Sure, for sure. So, so, and it but, carries through you because every time I see you, like, hey, new Mary making some money. So it, <laughs> it, it does, it does. Uh, it, it, it's all so, it came but, through. So, I, I, we, I really wasn't trained for this. Um, but I thank God um, was taught by my father to know exactly what you don't know. So we always try to bring in people that know much more than I in different areas, and we work together as a team. Mm-hmm. But the vision really was, the vision was creating a world organization that will absolutely love their fellow Jew and make a difference in the lives of the sick. That was the vision. And that was a vision that was written to me by different mentors of mine, and that's what I executed and followed. Um, and um, But there wasn't a business plan. It was kind of a you know step-by-step plan. We kind of learned a lot initially on the on the spot. Mm-hmm. And then we, but we began to really analyze everything, kind of like a Gemara and Talmudic experience. You know, we saw the situation, we pulled it apart into various different elements, and let's see what we can accomplish. You know, uh, you know, uh, take a sick child, but it's not just a sick child, it's their siblings, it's their parents. It's not just giving them a camp experience to make them feel like a, a person again, but we have to give them some psychological help. We have to give them some some support. We have to give them a normal normal family environment. We have to support them in their school growth. We have to support them even after their illness when they're still suffering traumatic experiences. We have to take the isolation and break it. We have to normalize an abnormal situation. We have to teach children that disability is a bad word that should never ever be used in their life. Mm-hmm. There's only kids with different abilities. Mm-hmm. So you can have kids that are physically compromised, as you well know, but they're the most creative, energetic, loving, personable people in the world. And when you look beyond their physical difficulties, you see a, 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 a king. Yeah. You see something glamorous. You see something beautiful. Mm-hmm. And that's what we have to do. We took pity and we just put, pushed it to the side. We need to give them respect. We right. need to give them acceptance. A wheelchair is not a disability. It's just a, a means of transportation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So, yeah. so, and that was created through the camp, through the organization, through the case managers, through the professionals, through the mar- marketing and the fundraising techniques. That message was created that created a revolution in our world, not just for the clientele that High Lifeline services, but for all of the people in our community that have special needs in various different walks of life. Mm -hmm. We have always been, and please God, hope to continue to be, the organization that people look up to that's been trailblazing 
and that uh, you know has set, set set the tone and set the path. Yeah, and we have uh, we have respect for everyone in this field. We work with everyone, and we don't want to be the only one in the field because we can't handle everything. I mean, we are the originators. We I believe that we're the best, <laughs> but uh, you know, A bias there. Yeah, but, but, uh, sure, sure, sure. But you know, we we're not the only, and we're, we're happy that you know there's more activity going on. Was there any time? During the process, especially in the early years when, you know, perhaps quote unquote success wasn't so foreseen that you want to just give up and go back to the more, you know, let's go, I'll get my paycheck, I'll, my mom is right, I'll go to business school. Or was there a time where you just wanted to say enough of this, it's just too much? There were, there were moments like that, yes. There were moments like that, you know, that's where my wife kicked in. She, <sighs> she was the one that kept on encouraging me. That's uh-huh. where my rabbinical mentors kicked in. Uh, they kept on, you know, pushing me. Yes, there were there were moments. Mm. Running an operation of this magnitude is a is very very overwhelming at times, especially when you take every case personally, mm-hmm. and you it's hard to say no. And there's you know huge monetary obligations that have to be fulfilled. The, the community is very generous to us, and we're very very grateful. But you know, there's always more needs, and sometimes you no. Know, than resources. Sure. So, um, yes. Yeah, so there are, there have been many, many times that you just want to say, listen, enough is enough. I can't, I can't deal with this anymore. But because we had, thank God, a strong family uh, anchor, and because we've had, we've had uh, you know, tremendous rabbinical uh, support and encouragement, that's yeah. why we're here today. Even with the present challenges that, you know, something are sometimes more frightening than they were 30 years ago. Yeah, right. But um, well, we're here. B- besides, besides financial tra- um, challenges, which of course any, any nonprofit I'm sure comes across as they grow, what are, some ch- what are some challenges that you are going, that have shown up or that, are, that you foresee for the organization? Well, you know, the, the personalities are always changing. The world personalities are changing. A mom of today is different than a mom of 30 years ago or 25 years ago. Mother, t- uh, 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 the the family today is, uh, the overwhelming majority of families, husband and wife are working. That's a, a, a necessity for an economic requirement. Mm-hmm. Child gets sick, someone maybe has to stay in the hospital. There's huge, huge financial, uh, you know. Burden. Situations. Sure. Uh, the, Time has become a problem in, in the year 2020. I don't know why time wasn't a problem in, the, in 1990, but it's a real problem today. Especially with all the different devices we have that are supposed to help save us time, right? Right. right. So everyone, everyone is so busy, you know, it's sure. impossible to get FaceTime with people. Mm-hmm. We have to, you know, we have to use Zoom as a as a as a communication tool, you know. You know, versus, so there are a lot of different things. This you know, podcast is not sponsored by Zoom. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, yeah. there are a lot of different things that, that that we have to use today that are different. Uh, you know, people are different. Uh, their needs are different. Their requirements are different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the hospitals are different. You know, they don't stay as long as they used to say kids, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, much more home intervention is required. And that adds a whole different level of stress. Uh, insurance has made the selection of doctors and treatments far, far more difficult. That's just the reality of life, you know. Mm-hmm. Whether you live in New York or you live in Nevada, it's all the same. So there, there are a lot of different things that are overwhelming. On the other hand, there have been tremendous strides in the medical world, whereas 20 years ago, certain diagnosis was kind of like a death sentence and we would tell them listen maybe just go to the empire state building and when no one's looking jump with your kid wow because there's no wow. future here really today uh, they're getting married these kids so you know where camp center was special where some of these situations were so horrific years ago that who would ever be able to deal with it today we were able to we were able to deal with it and they're able to function in the world Right. For those, right. That's, that's, that's amazing. The, are, are there, you know, you're in this for what, over 35 years now? 32 years. 32 right. years, um, which I'd love to t- just touch on in a second, but is to being involved in this work for so long, do you feel like you have gotten like desensitized to, to the hardships or to, and to the, to the, the sadder part of the jobs, uh, which is, you know, of, cause you're dealing with people who are with, with, terminal illnesses like every every year i'm i'm sure 
there are campers. I mean, I I've known I know a couple of guys who who who. Well, it's who not buried. just campers. We we you know our our population is ten times the. Oh size sure, of campers. right, so, and which so, you talked about. There's yeah. the families, and there's all these different um all these different uh, uh, yeah all the different programs that you are surrounded just just the one kid who's who's, who's sick. Of course, but I'm saying when it comes down to this, how do you stay? Focus and strong when there when there when there is a lot of a lot of death and sorrow within this job. Look, the day that I become desensitized to the pain of a family that is dealing with a sick child, or the death of a child, or a traumatic crisis experience that we dealt with in Muncie or in whatever uh, sure. in Poway and all these places. The day I become desensitized and I, my professionalism overwhelms my heart is the day for me to leave. Mm. How do we deal with it? We deal with it as a group together sometimes. We deal with it going to our rabbinical um, mentors. Uh, we deal with it, uh, you know, Chilling out a little bit. Uh, How do you chill out, Rabbi? Uh, I, I'm trying to figure that out myself. You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, so so the yeah. that's uh, that's a, it's the hard part of the job. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's really it's really the hard part of the job. Look, at this stage of the game, I'm a little bit more removed than I used to be. You know, I used to be involved with every case. I can't do that today, obviously. Yeah. But but I it, it, you know it hurts. You know, you when you go into um, to a place like Muncie after the stabbing and Project High was there. I spoke there myself and you see that the yeah. trauma. You go to Poway uh, the day after the shooting and I, I was speaking to the to the husband. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, you know, the stuff hurts and it's, uh, you know, you you, know, you yeah. go home and you say, yeah, listen, thank God everyone is healthy and well. So right. it's, it's not easy to desensitize, but we have to find ways of coping, of expressing, of, uh, you know, spiritually recharging, physically recharging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not a person that uh, does more than life than you know than, than what I do, but uh, <laughs> but you know I do take a walk every uh, you know I, I try to walk every day. I you know I I, 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 I enjoy the small th- small things in life. And, uh, yeah, that's what I tell you. you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm not a big uh, so maybe I should I, I, I should go to to a vacation once in a while. You know? Yeah, sign, sign up for uh, for the marathon this year. You know, me and you, thirteen miles. Let's do it. I'm always on the sidelines encouraging people. <laughs> it does help. It does help. We do when we do. We run by and we see you there. It definitely gives us an, uh, a, an extra oomph in our step. The um, I did love how um, in a discussion with with I, I believe you had with the Kleisenberger Rebbe that he mentioned how specific Chesed is that if a child asks for a Coke, don't get him a Pepsi. Right. The Kleisenberger Rebbe. I was introduced to the Kleisenberger Rebbe by. One of the in, initial lay leadership here, uh, Saul Mayer, who was uh, the president, is the co-president of Chalai Fine today, who was one of the greatest influences of the growth of this organization, a man of uh, great generosity and chesed. Uh, his loving kindness is, a, is, is legendary in our community. Uh, he introduced me to the Closing Rebbe Rebbe. We spoke about Chalai Fine, and that was one of the instructions he gave me. Yeah. If someone need, wants Coca-Cola in a hospital, don't get him Pepsi. And I walked away and I understood from that what helping someone means. You need to tailor, make the gift, the help to what the person needs. You cannot just be corporate and sterile about it. it now, that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of resources. But that's what makes a difference. One hundred percent, and I and I experienced that once again in the High Life Line in, in Camp Simcha and Camp Simcha Special. That whatever the child wants, and and there's you know we have over a hundred children there. Whatever they want, whatever they need. I mean, it could be a delicious, for example, dinner. Delicious, the best camp food I've ever had in my life. Yet, if a child wanted an X, Y, and wanted a pizza with specific mm-hmm. toppings, or he wanted dessert before his dinner, whatever, whatever that may look like, there will be another fifty specific right. dinners being made for every single kid. The spicy fries, the regular fries, the onion rings, um, and you get yeah. There was a sensitivity, and and which at, where I resonated with that with that quote was because that does shine through through the programs and through the way the the mentality of the organization runs is that it's really like a family. Whatever a child wants, they'll go above and beyond to get it done. And that's really the the key here. The key here is that it's a family. Every staff member, every volunteer has that heart, has that 
desire to help, has that generosity within them. It's it's special. It's so special. It's so it's the greatest quality that our community has, and we have the privilege of having the men and the women under our auspices to be able to execute that. Yes. So it's not just for the five hundred kids in Camp Simcha summer. It's 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 for the five you know the fifty eight hundred families throughout the year. There are over over five thousand volunteers here that uh, help on a weekly basis around the world yeah it's a, it's really yeah. pr- pretty incredible and they come from all different parts of our community uh you know whether they're crown heights or williamsburg or the u of penn or you know yeah. uh, you know so i had how, how do you how does one hop how does one get people fired up about an idea about a mission how do you how does one you know lead such um such a vast group of people and such a varieties group of people from around the world with different backgrounds mentalities how do you how do you reel them all in and get them moving and shaking and taking action into an idea into a into a philosophy that you believe in? One of the greatest statements that I've ever read in my life was a statement by the Lubavitcher Rebbe: "Leaders create leaders. Mm. We thank God have created leaders here, and they constantly inspire other leaders, who inspires other leaders. So it's a movement of leadership." Yeah. And if you if you're a volunteer um, driving someone to a hospital, if you're a volunteer interfacing with a sibling, if you're an iShine volunteer, if you're a Project High volunteer going into a, a crisis, you're a Camp Simcha counselor, whoever you are, but you're a leader in what you do, and it's the accomplishment is so pristine and so real. When someone drives someone to the hospital, you see, especially we train everybody, it's not just it's not just you just put you into a situation. You see your 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 results exactly. right away. It's beyond. So you become excited about it. You become passionate about it. It becomes yours. Mm. And that's the key. Mm. That's the key. That's why you have found there's been such a change in our community over the past 32 years because of the Camp Simcha, because of the High Lifeline volunteer, that they have gone back into their communities. They got involved in their synagogues. They got involved in their shuls. They got involved in their yeshivas and their schools. They got involved in their in their activities of, of, their, of, the, of the chesed, of the generosity of the philanthropic organizations in their community all over the world. Yeah. And anywhere you go, anywhere you go, there's no other organization that can say that, that anywhere you go, in any type of community that we have, whether it's Williamsburg, whether it's Crown Heights, whether it's Williamsburg, Virginia, or whether it's Nevada, or whether it's uh, Montreal, or Toronto, or, or Gibraltar, or Antwerp, or w- wherever you are, you'll always find a Kim Simcha Lifeline person. Mm. What I love about, and what I'm picking up from you, just seeing you have this conversation right now, and you explaining is your passion and your excitement that you have talking about High Lifeline, the volunteers, the organization, what you've been dedicating your life to for the past 32 years. And it just begs me to ask the question is how do you still have and continue to have this passion and energy to keep on going after so many years? I see what we do. I see it in front of my eyes. I see the difference that the, a case manager makes when they direct a family to the right treatment or they help them through a crisis. I see what a Project High volunteer does when they go into a situation and they're able to help someone that's traumatized and become, you know, be able to deal with life. I see, I walk into Kem Simcha, I see what a counselor, what a staff member can do to a, to a, to a child. I see what a wish at the wall trip can do to a, a family in Israel. I see it in front of my eyes. I see it in front of my eyes. I see the accomplishment, the results. It's not about how much money we raise. It's look at what we're doing. Mm. And that is the greatest inspiration of all. Mm. That's amazing! Wow. For any young leaders out there listening in, other, do you have any? Do you have two tips that you could go do it? The community needs you. Don't live for yourself. Get involved. Hmm. Make a difference. Don't wait to be recruited. You become the recruiter. You have an idea. Make sure it's wholesome. Make sure it's honest. Make sure it's acceptable, and go do it. Do it. Don't live for yourself. Do it. Live a great life. But don't live for yourself. 
Wonderful, wonderful. One last thing, I, I know how difficult it is to, uh, for, you know, earlier on, it was, you were begging for people to get shorn as sta staff members, volunteers in, in Camp Simcha. Now you have a long waiting list and you have to turn people away. You know, my sister is old enough to be a counselor. <laughs> maybe we could pull something off here. You know, maybe, 2021. Uh, <laughs> Rabbi Simcha Scholar, thank you so much thank you. for having me thank and for you. sharing and may be blessed to continue leading this incredible organization and showing thank up you. as a lamplighter in this world. Thank you.